Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. <laughs> it is so good to get together for this day of our new year, the year 2013. I bet you're struggling with that just as I am, that 2013. But we are together. We are beginning a new year. We celebrate worship. We celebrate communion today. And we are delighted that we can share this time with one another. A couple of announcements. First, uh, today is a day when we return to the simplicity, or at least after today, the simplicity of the sanctuary after the elegance and color of Christmas decorations. I hope you have enjoyed the colors and the lights and the, the trim and the candles as much as I have. It's, it creates an atmosphere, I, I think, of joy and, and of uh, mystery. But after today, we return to the beautiful simplicity of our, of our chestnut and our blue crosses. Immediately following worship, we will join together in taking down our decorations. Uh, we have asked uh, different people to be in charge of different areas, like the altar and the, the, and the decorations of lights and garlands and the windows and the trees. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest that you do, if you'd like, is get a cup of coffee and some crumpets and then come back in and we can work at uh, taking the, the decorations down or just begin immediately following. It'll be a good time. It'll be a time of fellowship. And we'll put on some final Christmas tunes to show us the way. So I invite you for that experience. Uh, the prayer shawl group is also meeting immediately after church in the back of the sanctuary, the, the prayer shawl group. And also this week is uh, the Senior and Friends Community Soup Supper this Wednesday, and we begin back to our kind of normal world already after the Christmas flurry and rush. So it is good to come together, and let us now invite our choir to share with us our choral intro. join together in our call to worship. Come and gather in the Spirit. Let us gather in worship and grace. Bring the gifts of yourself. We bring our hearts and souls in 
Bring your gifts of presence and love. Today is Epiphany Sunday. It's the 12th day after Christmas and always January 6th, and they come together today, this year. Epiphany is a day that is celebrated in a number of churches, the Coptic Church and some of the other Orthodox churches, as actually official Christmas Day. Unlike us, who celebrated December 25th, the Coptic Christians and others, Celebrated today when the Magi come, the, the wise men, the three kings, the astrologers, according to the book, book, book of Matthew, come and pay homage and bring gifts to the baby Jesus. So this is Epiphany Sunday, a, a day of awakening and a day of newness and a day of understanding. So let us hear then those, that scripture in the Gospel of Matthew. It's the only place in our in our Bible, in the New Testament, especially where you will find this story, the story of the three kings. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together <clears throat> all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Well, then Herod secretly called the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, come and bring me word that I too may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, oh, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down, and they paid him homage, and then opened their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Let us join in the prayer that is printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. O oh God, you made of one blood all nations, and by a star of the east revealed to all peoples him whose name is Emmanuel. Enable us who know your presence with us 
so to proclaim his unsearchable riches that all may come to his light and bow before the brightness of his rising, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. Now behold him arise, King and God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, sound to the earth and skies. Oh, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright. Westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect life. Now I'd like to invite the children to come down for a time of sharing. Good morning. You're hiding over there. Why don't you come over here? You can hold this for me. Yeah. So what did I give you to hold? I only had four. Hold on a second. My goodness. Let's find something here. Hmm. Here. You can hold this one. Okay. What did I give you to hold? An animal. And what is the animal? Can you tell by looking at it? It's not, it's not in your backyard, it's a camel. Yeah, yeah, it's a camel. And you have a wise man, and you have, and you have a wise man. So how many, and you have, you don't have that in your backyard probably either. That's a donkey, isn't it? You told her? Okay, good. You think that might be a llama? Let me see. I think you're right. What are we doing with the llama in our day? Do, th do they have llamas back in Jesus' day? Susan? I think Anne Marie left that. Anne Marie left the llama. Okay. Why are there three wise men that you are each holding, do you think? You have one, two, three. Do you know why we have three wise men? Were there three wise men that went to visit Jesus after he was born? The three kings. The Bible actually doesn't state the number, doesn't say there were three, but there were three gifts that were given. Do you know what the three gifts are? Gold, myrrh, and frankincense. That's right. Gold and frankincense and myrrh are the three very, very valuable gifts that the story tells us that the wise men gave Jesus. Gold, of course, is a, a precious metal, right? And frankincense and myrrh are kind of in the, the spice and, and ointment category. They're like um, spices for foods and for ointments to make them smell good. And so they're, they're very precious gifts 
that were given Jesus by some of the most learned and wealthiest men of the day and age back in Jesus' time. So today is the day when we celebrate the wise men coming to Jesus and giving to them very special gifts. And today, we're to trace back our where we give gifts and receive gifts, right? Where we give and receive wrapped presents. It would go back to the story of the wise men who at Christmas, at Jesus' birth, gave him gifts. So you can thank the wise men for what you got for Christmas. Did you get anything for Christmas? No, did you? Yeah, I bet you did. Well, that's good. So thanks, wise men, for, for the great idea of sharing your love in this special gift-giving way. Because that's what it is. They shared their love in the special gift-giving way. So let's have a prayer together. There's only a few of you, but I bet you can repeat after me, can't you? You ready? Dear God, thank you for the wise men who gave gifts to Jesus that help us to celebrate our gift giving on Christmas. Amen. All right, thank you. Now, what I need you to do is have you bring up the wise men and the camel and the llama, and can you put them right there somewhere? Yeah, put them right in there. Wherever you can fit it in. They're perfect. You're doing great. Almost fell. Right in there. They, I, I saw that he brought them. Would he like to put them up here? You want to bring them up? Here, bring up the elephant and zebra. Yeah. And put them right there. Perfect. And the elephant, too. Nicely done. Thank you. Now it's complete. <laughs> With the elephant and zebra in place, that concludes today's service. And, uh, we need to say no more than that the children win the day always.
we come together in prayer, and there are a number of prayers printed in our, our bulletin, as you can, can see. I would simply add to those that uh, Barry Hughes is possibly going to have surgery for his brain tumor on Tuesday. That is still uh, to be finally determined. Um, but for those of you that have been wondering, they were able to open up the, um, the canal and drain the fluid off, which was impacting his uh, brain so negatively and causing him so many problems. Uh, so they're going to be taking some further procedures, I do believe, probably sometime this week. We also need to tell you that there have um, been two deaths at this uh, time of year within our church family, an extended family. Uh, Bill Bell's uh, son-in-law passed away earlier this week, and uh, Bill and uh, Robin are here, Bill and Robin's son-in-law. And uh, Robert Wallace's grandmother, Annie Durham, who is 95, just passed away um, this week as well. So our prayers are, are with them, as well as all those who are in our bulletin and others who we certainly might not know about. We hold you in our hearts and minds as well. So let us now be in prayer with one another. For God, it is always a privilege and an opportunity and a grace-filled sacred moment to come together in prayer. Our hearts and souls are oftentimes filled with the joys of our life, the, the good things, the blessings, the gifts we have, and so we are grateful. We don't take them for granted. We pause we say thank you, what, a, what precious gifts we have, what precious treasures that we have received in life. They mean so much, they mean the world to us. So we first say thank you God for these gifts that we do have. And at the same time we recognize there are pains and sorrows, there's loss and there's grief that we also go through and we endure. There's brokenness sometimes in our lives, and so we long for healing, for reconciliation. We long for that balm in Gilead, which is going to anoint our wounds and bring back our spirits with fresh vigor and new life. So we look to you, God, to sometimes just sustain us, just hold us up and just keep us going. We look to you for healing, to show us the way, the new road of life and opportunity, where our potential might be unleashed and grace is everywhere. And so in your love, your love which we have experienced this Christmas season all the way to today, Epiphany, in your love we live and breathe. We pray that we might be filled with your light and we might be beacons of your elegance shining across the world and all might know of you and your love and your grace because we have done the very best we can to be Christ-like and to shine with the halo of your presence. So in Jesus' name, the name that launched a new age the one who was proclaimed by the angels as Lord and Messiah and Savior. In his name we pray and let us be in silence to be still as we come before you, our Lord and God. So with thanks and love, we say glory to the newborn King, peace on earth, mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled.
Our Bible is full of stories of roads. One of the famous road stories is of Paul on the Damascus Road. Some of you might remember the story. He was actually at that time bent on persecuting the Christian community. And so he was traveling with the authority of the high priest from Jerusalem to do just that. So it was on that famous road that he was struck down by light and by a vision, by an image that changed his life forever. Sometimes road stories and roads do change our lives. And it was partially that story where Paul became not a man of bitterness and hatred and violence addressed towards a people. It was that story on that road where he became a person who belonged to Christ that now was going to live Christ-like in his way of life. And it is partially due to that story and that new point of view that he wrote these words in 2 Corinthians about being a new creation. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is in making his appeal through us. Let us pray. Lord God, may it be your spirit of reconciliation, your spirit of love, living, and grace that flows through us and around us and supports us. And I pray that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth will be found acceptable in your sight. Amen. One of the most famous road stories in the Bible is the story when Moses led the people out of Egypt towards the promised land. It was a road story. It was a long road story. According to Exodus, it took about 40 years. If we were on the road that long, we might look older than we already look, some of us. There are many road stories that perhaps you have done in your life, some of which might have been life-changing for you sometime in, in your youth or in your young adulthood or, or maybe even older in retirement. You've gone on the road and traveled for a while. I had an a important road story back in the summer of 1969 when I traveled across country and around the country about 10,000 plus miles hitchhiking from place to place, car to car, truck to truck. It was one of those kind of road adventures that certainly was life-changing in ways that I'm not really sure how, but I do know that it was affirming of humanity, that on that particular road trip, and some of you might even remember that that was a period in our history that was somewhat difficult nationally. There was the Vietnam War conflict, there was uh, Cambodia, uh, there was the Kent State shootings, there was uh, all sorts of uprisings here, as well as abroad. It was a troublesome time on the national scene and with groups of people. But what that road trip did for me is it affirmed the essential goodness and the heart and the caring and the humanity of people individually, one by one. You might have had similar experiences, some of you, similar kinds of road trips that have changed your life. Maybe maybe giving you a different sense of belonging or a different sense of meaning about what it means to be alive. As I've contemplated this scripture from Paul about being a new creation, 
I decided that yes, I probably became a, a new creation after that summer of 1969. Not the first time, by the way, that it had happened. I'm sure there are times before that. I know there were times after that. And I'm guessing that there are still times to come when I'll experience a sense of newness about who I am. And maybe you've had the same experiences. Being new isn't just a once and for all type of thing. It, it kind of comes around over and over again. And for me, every time I come into this sanctuary on Sunday morning and have a certain, what would you call it, obligation to stand before you and say something memorable that you will never forget, there is a sense of renewal for me every time that happens. It's, it's like I've got to reconnect to God in a different way and be very still and listen to what God might possibly have to say to me that I might possibly be able to share with you. Being a new creation happens all the time. Paul was right. It's got to do with starting over, starting fresh, every single day. As I reread the story of, what shall we call them, the three kings, the wise men, the astrologers, the magi, as I reread that story of these academic people, these, these learners from the stars, from the scriptures, these men of knowledge and understanding and probably of wealth and of privilege, as I reread their story, I was struck by a couple things. One is that they were on two road trips. One moving from where they lived, wherever that was, some people suggest Persia, towards Jerusalem where they contacted King Herod, and another moving a short journey down to Bethlehem, but then a longer journey from Bethlehem back home, as the scripture says, by a different road because they had been warned in a dream not to trust Herod. A very good dream indeed. But what about these men help us understand life? It's kind of where I've ended up this morning. I've looked at this story of Christmas for about a month now. We started in Advent talking about the Christmas story. And here we are a month later, and I'm still talking about it. What about this story is important? And that's where I'm at this morning. Is there anything here that can help us live our life, other than the obvious, that we celebrate the birth of Jesus of Nazareth to Moses, to Mary and Joseph, and he goes on and becomes, as Paul says, the Christ. No longer do we regard him in human form, but regard him in a godly form. Other than this obvious storyline, is there anything about the Magi that can help us connect to the world? So I'd like to suggest a couple of things this morning. The first one has to do with a, a, a sense of, of, of meaning. These are men who found their meaning in research, in study, in academics, in looking at the stars and mapping the heavens, in bringing together prophecies and writings with what they observe in life. They were observers of humanity and the heavens. They were committed to this kind of learning and observation. So one of the things that I think the story teaches us is that we also, in life, need to be on a lifelong journey of learning. There is so much to know. So much to know. I'm thinking that probably for kids in school, sometimes it must be overwhelming what they are expected to learn, starting now in kindergarten. What they learn in kindergarten, by the way, I don't think I learned until third grade. But now they, they got to learn it a couple years younger. I don't know how they do that. We, we are so, so immersed in new knowledge 
that I sometimes think we actually lose the fact that learning and knowledge is an incredible gift that God has given us. To be able to learn about life is one of the gifts of the story. It helps give our world meaning, this concept of learning. The second thing we discover in the Magi story is that not only did they learn something, but when they had learned what they learned, they became committed to that. They dedicated their very lives and existence to it. What I'm referring to is they now made the trip from wherever they lived to find out more about this child that their learning has told them is being born. There is now a sense of belongingness. They are going to belong, if you will, now to a larger community. They are not going to just be part of this small learning community. They have committed and dedicated themselves in their travels and in their love and understanding to a greater community of belongingness. I think it is clear in life that we all need to have some sort of meaning. Is that, is that not true? Would anyone like to disagree with that? I think we need something to give us meaning. Something. And is it not true that we all really need to belong to something? We all need somebody and something to give our lives meaning, a sense of meaning, a sense of belongingness. One of the things we probably should be teaching constantly is that we do need those two things, and then we also have a choice about how to go about those and try to encourage people to make the best choice they can. If you have to belong to something, then find something really healthy to belong to. If you have to have meaning in life, then find something really significant and meaningful to give your life meaning. I think in the story of the Magi, we are learning that. They have dedicated themselves to learning, and then they rededicated in a new creation moment to finding and committing their love and their gifts of life to this child that changes the world. The way they did that is the third point I want to make. They did that through worship, which is offering themselves, and through giving gifts. Through giving gifts. We, when, when, you're, when you're in love, when you care about somebody, don't, don't you like to give them things? You know, don't you? If, maybe if you're a poet, you might like to write them poetry. Or, or if you're an artist, you might like to draw them a picture. Or if, if you don't feel like you have those kind of creative bents, then maybe you like to buy them something special. And that, of course, is where the engagement ring kind of comes from. Everything goes back to the Bible in some way. The, the Magi giving gifts, the, you get on bended knee in, in the, the stories, the Hallmark movies at least. You get, you get down on bended knee and you offer a ring to your loved one in this fashion, do you not? Doesn't that look a lot like the one king who is on bended knee offering his gift? We, out of our sense of meaning and sense of belonging in life, love to give gifts to people that we care about. And if you also are the receiver, you love to receive the gift as well. So the story teaches us the blessed gift of being able to give gifts. What a wonderful thing it is to give life meaning, to be a gift giver and to be a very graceful gift receiver. The fourth point the story teaches us 
is that after you have had these moments of epiphany, these moments of, of ultimate grace and of deep convicting love, after you have had a sense of meaning and belongingness and of gift giving, then you are changed. You are changed. Life is no longer the same. You see it, you hear it, you smell it, you experience it differently. Life is different. You are, as Paul says, now a new creation. And when you are a new creation, you don't do things the same old way that you used to. In this story, they go home by a different road because they were afraid of Herod. There is a sense that the truth is in that story that King Herod was not changed for the good by this event. But there's also a sense that the Magi absolutely needed to change their life. They had to do things differently because they were changed. We are in a new year. For some people, it's just to change the calendar. For me, the new year is always a change in attitude. It starts in Advent and goes through to right now. The new year is not a day, it's a season. It's a season of new birth, a season of new life. It's a season of God with us. And whenever you take that seriously and allow it to impact your life with meaning and a sense of belongingness, then the next road you get on is never the same. It is a new road. Amen. As we celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we will be coming together in the newness of this road, the newness of this event this year. You may remain seated for verse 2 of Joy to the World. Here I'd like to share with you the communion service entitled The Great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Your response is also with you. The Lord be with you. Your next response will be we lift them up to the Lord. Lift up your hearts. Your next response will be, it is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, O God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remains steadfast. You delivered us from, kept, <clears throat> from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth, with all the company of heaven, we praise your name in this hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him.
to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. At the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do of this, do so in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant that is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. It is the cup of reconciliation, the cup of redemption. And today, we join together in receiving the bread and the cup. Will the ushers please come forward? As the ushers pass the plate down the aisle and you take a morsel, please hold on to that bread until we have all received and then together we will partake together.
This morsel, though small, is certainly a symbol of life and of the new creation. As you eat, then, of this bread, which reminds us of the body of Jesus, think of it as nourishment that you are being created anew for your new road trip. Eat, then, in that knowledge. As the tray is passed down the aisle, we suggest you pass it to the next person along and then take the cup out of the tray. Hold your cup until we all have received and we will take together. This cup doesn't hold too much. But what it does hold is meaning. It holds a sense of belongingness. Our rituals and our symbols and our stories are important to us in life. They, they help ground us with a reality that does offer those new meanings, the possibilities of creation alive and well in us. So as you drink of this cup, remember its history. It's very, very long history. Remember the Last Supper when Jesus stood with his disciples and offered them his life, offered them new possibilities and opportunities. And as you drink of this, let this fuel you 
as a new person in love, as a new person of grace, as a new person of God. Drink this and have Jesus in your heart. Let us join together in our unison prayer in our bulletin. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. and glory, God of time and space, when we fear the future, give to us your grace, in the midst of changing ways, give us still the grace to praise. Many give one spirit, one love known in many ways, in our differences, blessing from diversity we praise. face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.